This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Welcome to Livermore and the Bankhead Theater. A, spe a special thanks goes out to the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory for providing this exciting science series for students and their parents. This is an awesome partnership of the lab and the educators. First of all, I want to find out if there's any girls here interested in science. Great. This next section is for you. <clears throat> I want to address all the 7th and 8th grade girls here that have a special interest in science. The sixth annual Reflections on Your Future event will be held at Livermore High School in the Student Union on February 18th from 7, <clears throat> excuse me, 7 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. Reflections on Your Future is an introduction to the GIT set, Girls Exploring Technology, Science, and Engineering Together. The program offered at the high school girls in the three, district, uh, three area districts. GIT set is a program designed to encourage girls to pursue their interest in technology, science, math, and engineering. Students may choose to attend one of the four workshops, architecture, web design, biology, and robotics. For additional information and to register, please contact Kathy Adelman at 925-606-4812. Now for today's topic, Armageddon, avoiding Armageddon, diverting asteroids with nuclear explosives. This lecture presents an overview of the impact threat of an asteroid followed by the systematic development of the requirement to divert such an object. Our presenters today are Dr. David S.P. Dearborn and teacher Tom Scheffler of Granada High School. Dr. Dearborn is a graduate of UCLA and the University of Texas at Austin. He has held positions in the Copernicus Institute in Warsaw, the Institute of Astronomy in Cambridge, the California Institute of Technology, and the Stewart Inst Observatory in Tucson. He is currently a research physicist at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. His current skill, <clears throat> excuse me, his current research on the diversion of asteroids by nuclear explosives mixes his skills in astrophysics and nuclear weapons effects. At, <clears throat> it began in 2003 for the Planetary Defense Conference and resulted in publications cited by NASA NASA's 2006 Near-Earth Object Survey and Deflection Study for the Congress. Today, this research continues with the detailed modeling of the effects of nuclear explosives on asteroids. Mr. Scheffler received a Bachelor of Science degree in Physics and Applied Mathematics from Western Michigan University and a Master's of Arts degree in Astronomy and Astrophysics from the University of California at Berkeley. While at Berkeley, he researched, analyzed, and cataloged Hubble Space Telescope images of galaxies. Observational research involved the detection and the study of extrasolar planets and discovered supernova 1998-DT while working with the Katzman Automatic Imaging Telescope <clears throat> team. During his graduate studies, he fell in love with teaching and entered the teaching profession in 2000. So, to start it all off, let's give them a great big hand and warm welcome, Dr. Dearborn and Mr. Sheffield. Okay. Um, my interest, as I was introduced, has been in how we could use nuclear explosives to divert an asteroid should one be found coming our way. And that's what I've uh, uh, been working on in particular, but because we're giving a talk to a broader audience here, 
we wanted to start off uh, introducing the whole, the wider issue of asteroids and how we know uh, what, an issue, what there might, problems might be with them. And uh, to do that, what we hope you come away from the talk learning is a little bit about, well, what's the concern? And if you go visit the uh, Arizona desert and see the Behringer Crater, you'll see one reason that you might be concerned. Uh, and how do we find asteroids? So we'll, we'll, we'll try to go over that a bit. Once we've talked about finding asteroids, the question is, what are they? And we heard during the uh, pre uh, uh, section of this that asteroids are large, rocky things, and that's correct, but there's more we can say uh, about them and their structure and what we'd have to do. Uh, given that, how would you move them? And so we'll address some of the basic physics for what you'd need to do to take an asteroid and say, well, instead of hitting the Earth, why don't you go by? And uh, so we'll address that. And then in, we'll finish it off with what uh, I've been working on, which is why would you consider nuclear explosives as a way of diverting the asteroids? What is it nuclear explosives bring that many other technologies wouldn't? Now, as to why they're of more than academic impact, um, back when I was a student uh, driving out to McDonald Observatory, <laughs> I used to drive through a ridge in the hills, which is right about here, and there were mountains up in the center. And at the time I was driving through there, it was thought that's a volcanic uplift. But, you know, people go drilling out there, and they, when they drilled down, they didn't find oil, they found, they found breccio, shocked rock with lots of fractures in it. And when they backed off and looked at it, they say, oh, look, that looks just like a crater on the moon. And it is a crater. Uh, and so the Earth has more than 150 known craters on the Earth's surface, and uh, some of them, like the Sudbury Crater here, are very large, that's over 200 kilometers across, and the question is, well, you know, why is it only 150? Uh, and this one, though, is one of the oldest craters we know of. It's in a part of the oldest rocks that we have on the surface of the Earth, and it's 1.8 billion years old. Most of the craters that we know of are in rocks that are much younger than that. So uh, that brings up the question. Why don't we see more craters on the Earth? Certainly when we look at our, our nearest neighbor, the Moon, which is much smaller than the Earth, the Moon is absolutely covered in impact craters. And it's not that uh, debris in the solar system has been you know, considerate and thoughtful. It's like, well, we'll miss the Earth, we'll just hit the Moon. Earth has been bombarded just as much as the Moon has, in fact, proportionally more. But what the Earth has that the Moon doesn't is an atmosphere, is weather, is erosion. So over the, the course of time, evidence of cratering is, uh, is wiped away. But uh, certainly, just as the Moon is, was, the entire surface was bombarded once upon a time, the entire surface of Earth was bombarded, and may be bombarded again. So in 1998, uh, NASA was charged with the task of surveying the sky and finding any asteroid, any uh, a near-Earth object with a diameter of one kilometer or greater. And to be finished by last year, to look to try to find every object one kilometer or greater that was uh, potentially hazardous to the Earth. And then in 2005, uh, Congress asked NASA to expand their search to look for objects as small as 140 meters. So to give you an idea of, of how many objects we've found, here is the inner solar system as we knew it in the year 1800. So here's the Sun, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. And 100 years later, as of 1900, we start to see little dots. Each of these little green dots is an asteroid that is outside of Earth's orbit. So we don't need to worry, we don't need to worry about them. The ones that are red are the asteroids whose orbits cross the Earth's orbit. So this is what we knew about a little more than a century ago. By 1950, we knew of this many. By 1990, eight years before the Space Guard project started, we knew about this many. After one year of the Space Guard project, we knew about this many. And as of 2006, this is our picture of the inner solar system. Now fortunately, most of these are ones that are never even gonna come close to hitting us, but all the ones that you see in red 
are objects that cross Earth's orbit. So of the 350,000 known asteroids, there are about 4,500 that are so-called near-Earth objects. These are objects that cross Earth's orbit, and of these 4,500, a little more than 800 of them have been labeled potentially hazardous objects. These are the ones to keep an especially keen eye on. And the new survey that is uh, going to be looking for asteroids as small as 140 meters expects to increase the number of near-Earth objects from 4,500 to about 100,000, and the number of potentially hazardous objects from around 800 to around 20,000. So clearly this is a threat worth taking seriously. So let's talk about, you know, what is, what is the nature of asteroids? Asteroids are rocky, irregularly shaped objects. These, uh, these nine images here are all images of the same asteroid named Ida. Uh, student in the previous session, I think, rather keenly noticed, uh, kind of resembles uh, chicken McNuggets. Um, but this is all the same asteroid. Give you an idea of how large this is. This is about 36 miles across. In fact, this asteroid is kind of special. It actually has its own moon, which is about a mile across. And one, uh, one challenge for dealing with an asteroid is, let's say that for some reason you get it into your head that the way to save the Earth from an asteroid is to land on the surface, drill a hole, and put a bomb in the hole. I don't know where anybody would get that sort of crazy idea, but let's say it occurs to somebody to do that. Well, if you were on the surface of this rather large asteroid, or rather if you were on the surface of, let's say, a typical asteroid, one kilometer across, a 200-pound person would weigh about one-tenth of an ounce. Put it another way, you kick off the ground when you're just walking at a normal speed. If you lift your foot an inch, you've kicked off the ground with a force that will give you about twice the speed you would need to escape the gravity of this asteroid. So as soon as you put your drill bit into the asteroid, you are bouncing off into space. Another thing that makes dealing with the asteroids kind of tricky is the motion they undergo. So not only do asteroids rotate on their axis just like the Earth does every 24 hours, they also tend to wobble or precess just like a top. If you spin a top and put it on the top of the table, not only does it spin on its axis really fast, but it kind of wobbles. And these two effects together, uh, this tumbling motion and this rotating motion, uh, add to the challenge of how do, you, how do you deal with this asteroid. Uh, another thing to consider, what is the structure of the asteroid? Is it uh, a huge pile of rubble, gravel, rocks, stones held together by its own gravity? An example of that is the asteroid Itokawa which was visited by the uh, Japanese spacecraft Hayabusa? Or uh, is the asteroid a solid chunk of rock, such as the asteroid Eros is? They come in both varieties, but uh, we found most asteroids tend to be in the rubble variety, and a minority seem to be in this variety. Anybody know why this is a particularly apropos asteroid to discuss today of all days? Eros, of course, being another name for... Happy Valentine's Day, everybody. So once you have found the asteroid, the question is, is, it, is its orbit one that is going to bring it into contact with the Earth? And this is a problem that you have to consider three dimensions. For example, let's say that this blue ellipse here represents the orbit of a comet. This red circle represents the orbit of the Earth. This looks pretty scary. It looks like it might hit us here, and it might hit us here. Unless you take a third dimension into account, in which case this orbit is tilted, which means every time it crosses Earth's orbit, almost every time, I should say, the comet either passes above the Earth or below the Earth. But, like the comet or the asteroid itself, not only does the comet kind of tumble and wobble, but the orbit itself will precess or wobble in space. Let me get this animation going again. So here you see the orbit precessing and wobbling and every time you see a red dot up here, that's when the comet's path intersects the Earth's path, and there is the danger of an impact. So the question is, how do we know an asteroid's orbit? Once we've found the asteroid in space, how do we know where it's going to go? So determining the orbit of a comet or asteroid is very difficult and very time-consuming. So for example, let's say 
we initially spot an asteroid right here at point A, and we observe it over the course of days, weeks, and we observe it go from point A to point B. We have an idea of the shape of its orbit, but just from, say, this much data alone, it would be hard to tell, is it going to follow this yellow, wider elliptical path, or maybe this somewhat smaller red elliptical path, or something in between. Both of these orbits would fit the data, yet one of these paths could bring it into contact with the Earth, and one of, this, one of them could make it miss by a million miles. So sometimes it takes not only several observations, but actually waiting to see how long it takes to come back, waiting for one or more complete orbits. So to be able to determine the path of a comet or an asteroid takes typically years and multiple orbits in order to know with any accuracy where is this thing going. So as Thomas just told you, if you're doing, if you spotted an asteroid and you're now calculating its orbit and you're calculating that orbit putting in the sun, the, all the major planets and the asteroid that you see and you're using only gravity, by the time that uh, that you've watched it for about 10 orbital periods, the uncertainty in the orbit gets small enough that you could say, oh, I can project that orbit now, now a thousand years, and I can tell where it is to less than an Earth radius in a thousand years. And that means you could tell it was going to hit you in a thousand years. And that would be true if the solar system had only the planets that we know about, counting Pluto or not, uh, the, um, and, and the sun and nothing else. Now, you may have noticed there are other things in the solar system. When you go outside, there's light. And light all by itself matters when you start talking about periods longer than 100 years. So the light just falling on the surface of the uh, this asteroid, actually it feels it and it pushes it a little bit. And so that counts. And, and it doesn't count very much ten year, for 10 years, but when you're pushing on it for 100, 200, 300 years, it begins to matter. And then worse than that, the light that falls onto the comet or the uh, asteroid is absorbed and it heats the asteroid up and the asteroid begins to radiate out infrared and comes to a temperature balance just like the Earth is in a temperature balance with the sun. And there's a real question then about what's the surface of the asteroid like? If the surface of the asteroid is something with good conduction, it's a big hunk of iron, the light that falls on it is conducted down deep and the asteroid sort of comes to an even temperature and it doesn't care uh, whether the sun's shining on it or not. It's radiating out about the same energy all the time. On the other hand, if you have a poor conduction surface like sand, uh, the, the asteroid, this little layer of sand heats up, gets very hot as, as the asteroid uh, sees the sun, as that part of the asteroid sees the sun. And then the sunset terminator of the asteroid is very hot and is radiating out the energy fast. And then as the asteroid roads uh, continues turning on around, the sunrise terminator is cold. Now that light radiating out is like a little rocket. And it pushes the asteroid, and how it pushes it depends on the moments of inertia of the asteroid, and its spin, and how that changes with time, and it depends on the uh, surface structure and, and composition of the asteroid. Those are things we can't know without going there. And that's called the Yarkovsky effect. To give you an example of how the Yarkovsky effect can, can impact things, there's an asteroid that was seen in 1950 originally and reobserved in 2000 with uh, radar, and uh, it has some small chance of hitting the Earth formally in the uh, year uh, 2880 on a Saturday, the 16th of March. I guess that would be during a basketball game. And uh, if you start adding things to your calculation, what about the tidal effect of the core of our galaxy? What about the rotation rate of the center of the sun? What about adding some more objects to the solar system, like the largest 61 asteroids? Well, if you come down to the Yarkovsky effect, it by itself, over 800 years, can make a difference between the asteroid passing the impact point nine days ahead of the Earth, which is a clear miss. Even that 10 minutes is a miss, just barely. Uh, so passing nine days in front of the Earth and a clear miss, or passing 57 days behind the Earth, which is a clear miss. So the Yarkovsky effect, due to the light falling on it and not knowing the details of the structure, means we don't know, and we don't, without a space mission there, we can't know uh, that that's, uh, that object is a threat 800 years out. Now, when you get in closer in time, when 
you know, it's only 100 years to go or 50 years to go, things like this light doesn't matter so much anymore. And it's just the gravity and just the gravity of the major object. And in that case, uh, you can tell after five or 10 years of observations uh, that the thing is going to hit or is not going to hit. And when you add that all up and you say, well, what about all the asteroids we're seeing? As Tom told you, most of them are out here in the asteroid belt and they're orbiting out there and they don't come anywhere near the Earth. So most of them, we do an orbit for them and we say, not a problem. Next thousand years, probably even longer. No big deal. But some fraction of them that have orbits that come in by the Earth, uh, it's more difficult to know because if they have an orbit that make them pass very near the Earth, you know, the question is, as you go out in time, is that orbit going to change in a way that brings them into the Earth? Now, so we can tell that when we have less than a century, say 50 years, we can tell that it's going to hit or not. And you don't want to go out and start touching asteroids that are coming close to the Earth, but you don't know if it's going to hit. I mean, going out and touching the asteroid may make it hit when it wasn't going to. So, you know, at first do no harm. Be careful. Leave those alone until you know. But once you know, what can you do to stop it? And what you do to stop it has to operate not in centuries, but in several decades. It has, to, it has to be able to be applied 50 years out, 20 or 40 years out. Now, asteroids, as you saw, there are bodies out there, and those bodies are hitting the Earth. This isn't a theoretical thing. We've seen them hit. Every year, kiloton impacts hit the Earth. Now, something that makes, delivers a kiloton, a kiloton is the energy of a thousand tons of TNT uh, being put in the spot and going off. And let me tell you, a thousand tons of TNT, you want to stand a couple miles back. In fact, you saw that little vi video of my friends and I uh, out in the uh, New Mexico desert there with a big thing that went off. That was a something over a thousand tons of TNT. Uh, so don't stand close to it. It hurt the ears at two and a half miles away. Uh, the, um, uh, but every year, those things hit the Earth. They break up in the upper atmosphere, and you could set off a kiloton nuclear weapon 30 miles above San Francisco, and most people wouldn't know it. The pressure wave, all the things you think of with nuclear explosives, it would be too far away to bother San Francisco. They would see a bright flash. And, in fact, if you were in the middle of the Sudan desert a couple months ago, you would have seen one. One of these things hit. Uh, it, was it was actually the first one we've ever seen coming in and predicted where it was going to hit, and it hit there, and it was observed. Uh, now, if that happens every year, but it generally, unless it happens to be an iron, a hunk of iron, which is the rarest type of meteorite, it doesn't make it down to the Earth's surface and cause any problems. If you go out to the 500 to 2,000 year period, you're now talking the time scale on which 10 megaton events occur. And examples of a couple of 10 megaton events, one is the Behringer Crater, and the other was the Tunguska impact in Siberia that occurred about 100 years ago, 1908. The Tunguska event flattened 2,000 square kilometers of forest, but didn't leave a crater. And the difference between these two is that the Tunguska meteorite was a, almost certainly a stony rubble pile that came in, and as it went into the lower atmosphere, the pressure of air in front of it flattened it out, and it, it effectively burned up very quickly, leading to an explosion that was the equivalent of a 10 megaton, 10,000 kiloton uh, explosion. And it flattened, as I say, 2,000 square kilometers of forest. Now, for an actuarial view of this, the average population of the Earth is 12 and a half people per square kilometer. So this happened out in Siberia. No one was around. The population was a lot lower. No one was hurt. One guy broke his leg, but no one was hurt badly. Um, if this were to happen over a city, you would kill most of the people in the city. And that the statistical average rate of killing people from these things is about 25,000 people per thousand years. So that's the, that's the impact. It just happens all at once and rarely. So uh, this one, the difference, as I said, was it was iron. It hit the ground. Let me tell you, you didn't want to be within 20 kilometers of that one. Uh, on tens of thousands of year period, larger things hit. And they get up, start getting up to 
a thousand megatons. You know, a, a megaton is a thousand kilotons, and a thousand megatons is a gigaton. And uh, those things are regionally bad. That circle includes Los Angeles and San Francisco and Carson City. And inside that circle, if you had one of these larger asteroids that hit the Earth on this tens of thousands of year time scale, all the houses would be knocked down and burned up. And things would be destroyed much further out. And you're getting close to the place where people think that would be a global catastrophe. You get out to a million year period, you're starting to get up to the period where kilometer size objects impact us. And uh, you've got up to tens of millions of years and you have larger bodies like the 10 kilometer size object that they think made the, well they're pretty sure they know made the crater Chicxulub. Chicxulub is a crater, it's 150 kilometers across or so, um, it's from 65 million years ago and there's a big iridium layer. Iridium is a metal that comes in with uh, uh, meteorites and uh, it is right at the boundary between where there are dinosaurs and where there aren't dinosaurs. If that type of thing hits the earth, it's got global effects. I mean even the mere kilometer one that's a million years has global effects and you're talking about potentially billion people dying due to the effects. So what makes them risky is the asteroid is moving, it's got kinetic energy, and that en kinetic energy goes up with the mass, so the more massive it is, the bigger it is, the more dangerous it is, and the faster it moves, the velocity squared, the faster it moves, the more energy it carries. If we take a uh, sort of standard speed of approach, every pound of that uh, asteroid is carrying kinetic energy equivalent to about 50 pounds of TNT when it hits. It's going to be dissipated. So a 10 meter body traveling at a nominal speed carries the energy of about two and a half times Hiroshima's, uh, the bombs dropped on Hiroshima. And those happen with some regularity, but as I say, for stony ones, the energy is dissipated in the upper atmosphere and the, the pressure wave doesn't hit the ground, so you don't cause lots of problems every 20 years as you have a kiloton explosion. It's not on the Earth's surface, it would only be a Poseidon. If you come up to the 100 meter scale object, those carry about 2,500 times the energy of the Hiroshima bombs. And they happen uh, every 7,000 years or so. And that's a regionally bad thing to be happening. Okay? Um, if you come up to the kilometer size objects, the average energy may be two and a half million times the energy of the Hiroshima weapon and that's a global problem. And those things simply do hit us every million years or so and we can find the craters to prove it. So the question is, okay, how might we try to deal with an asteroid that's on a collision course with Earth? And one idea is, what if we just stuck a big old rocket on it and turned on the rocket and let the thrust slowly push the asteroid to another orbit. So here's a picture of Saturn V rocket, the rockets that we used in the Apollo missions to the moon. What if we just poked a rocket into the side, turned it on, and used conservation of momentum? If you have mass and you send some mass that way, the other mass is going to start moving this way. Problem is, let's say, let's be generous. Let's say we have almost twice as much time as they had in the movie Armageddon. You have 35 days instead of 18, you would need to burn 2,500,000 tons of fuel in order to move the asteroid enough. Let me say this number in a way that you can appreciate just how huge this number is. 2,500,000 tons. <laughs> to, to put it another way, if you had, well consider a, a fuel tanker. Fuel tankers are huge ships as it is. If you wanted uh, 25, or I'm sorry, uh, 2 million 500 tons of fuel, you would need a fuel tanker a little less than two miles long. So imagine a two mile long fuel tanker and figuring out how to get that into space. Probably not a viable option. Let's say you have a lot more time to deal with. Let's say you have about 20 years, that's about 7,000 days, and you want to apply the same idea, you would only need to burn 
10,000 tons of fuel. This seems like a much more reasonable number. Hey, this is doable, right? Until you consider the fact that most space missions these days uh, have fuel of about five tons. So probably not a viable option. Also, adding to the complexity is because the uh, asteroids spin and tumble and precess and wobble, the direction of the thrust would be constantly changing. It would be like attaching a crazy fire hose to the rocket, or to the asteroid. So that just wouldn't work. Now, one idea that I, that I think is kind of novel, and this would work for your smaller threats, so the 100 meter sized threats, and this idea is called a gravity tractor. And the idea is, what if you take a massive spacecraft, fly it to the asteroid, and let's say you have 50 years lead time to work with, and you just park this massive spacecraft next to the asteroid and just use rockets for station keeping so that it stays and just hovers near the asteroid for 50 years. Over that time, the gravity of the spacecraft, although not very strong, will be enough to cumulatively, over the decades, slowly tug the asteroid to a safe orbit. Now, this is something that might work, and, and people are investigating that idea. Another idea, what if we shoot it with a laser? Or as some people refer to them, laser. So, uh, what if we, sh if we shot a laser at an asteroid, or, or somehow got material on the asteroid to vaporize, cause it a, an explosion on the surface of the asteroid, that would be like a little rocket effect, and that would might maybe push it to another, another orbit. Well, if you consider the world's premier laser, which is the National Nation Facility right down the street, well, in order to deliver the correct amount of energy, for this to happen, you would need to send about 5 million pulses from NIF, which would take around 6,000 years. I'm afraid uh, the Death Star option is also out. At the moment. At the moment. So, the option that we are going to talk about, and the fundamental reason of why you should consider nuclear explosives as an option. Obviously, you uh, heard a moment ago that, uh, for the, uh, that uh, as movies often uh, portray it, where you use a nuclear explosive uh, and break the thing apart, that that didn't work the way they showed it. And it doesn't work the way they showed it. But it is the most efficient way of carrying energy. And so how would you use it? Uh, when I say it's the most efficient way of carrying energy, fundamental science says the nuclear bond is the strongest bond in nature. It's what holds the nucleus together. If you can extract energy from the nucleus, nuclear bond, as you do in either fission or fusion, you can use that energy. And the energy that you get from a pound of fusion, if you have a pound of material and you can get it to fuse, the energy you get is about three million times what you get from chemical energy, if you had a pound of uh, gas and oxygen to, to, to put together. And so it's a much more efficient way of carrying mass. And so with the, as long as payloads, as long as rockets can't lift thousands of tons to deep space, uh, the question is, well, what can they lift? And you can take the energy necessary to change orbits in this way along. The question is, how do you use it? And how you use it depends on what the uh, threat is. If, as we discussed earlier, the threat is discovered 50 years out, then the speed change that you need is very small. And so you can use it in a standoff mode where you put the nuclear explosive and you blow it up not on the surface, but above the surface. And when you do that, it heats up the material on one surface, uh, the one hemisphere of the asteroid. That material blows off, and it gives the asteroid a push. And when the asteroid gets a push, if the push is small enough that the gravity of the asteroid holds the bulk of it together, you can change the asteroid from having an orbit that's going to impact the Earth to one that's not going to impact the Earth. Alternatively, you can... Um, uh, if you don't have time, maybe you do consider blowing it up. Now, Livermore has great experience at both making craters and modeling craters. And for the nudge, the figure of merit is, can I change the speed of a thing 20, 30 years out? Can I change the speed by a centimeter a second? So that's, that's the sort of magnitude of how much you have to change the speed. Here's an object going 30 kilometers a second. 
and I have to change it one centimeter a second to have it miss 30 years out. And that's so, it's not much, but when you're talking about a billion ton object, it takes a bit of push. Alternatively, <coughs> if the um, object is not discovered 30, 40 years out, but it's less than 10 years to go, then the push that you have to give it is large. And is there anything we can do there? And I'm going to make a case to you that, yes, in this case, fragmenting it actually does improve things, but you've got to pay attention to some conditions. Now, when we do these calculations, we simulate the ex nuclear explosive pushing the asteroid and see the pieces that come off of it when pieces come off, or in the case of fragmenting it, we see all the debris that it creates, and we have to follow that debris or pieces down orbits. And we do that, we picked a, a series of uh, typical near-Earth object orbits, and you have to see, well, how much push do you have to have to, to uh, save yourself, uh, to, to change it from being hitting to not hitting, and if you fragment it, what's still threatening you? So to, uh, as we talked about, to push the thing, you've got to heat a lot of mass, and to heat a hemisphere of a kilometer scale object, you need to get five to ten kilotons of energy absorbed into that surface so that right at the ground zero, the place uh, closest to the uh, nuclear explosive, you're heating about that much material to uh, become a gas and to explode. And then the, it gets thinner as you go out from there. And in that case, the impulse is sufficient to change the orbit by about that centimeter a second. And because you're standing off away from the asteroid, in this case, and you're shining a lot of the uh, energy from the bomb that way, and that way, and that way, and that way, only a fraction of the energy falls on the device. The closer you are, the larger the fraction, but only a fraction. And for most efficiency, you need about 100 kilotons to deliver the 5 to 10 kilotons to the surface. The, uh, as I said, there's an optimal height. If you're too close, you heat up a small patch of surface too much, and you basically break it, so don't get too close. If you stand off too far, you radiate too much energy into space, and you maybe not heat it up enough. So there is an optimal distance out to uh, be. And it's, it's not a hard to uh, figure out what that optimal distance is, but you've got to pay attention. Now the models that we've done, we have 3D codes at the lab, but we chose a 2D code because it was uh, faster and we could investigate lots of different material properties for different types of asteroids, and it was a, a better for the original uh, calculations. The uh, generic structure that we chose to look at for all the cases was a kilometer size object, the type that would be a real bad problem should we discover it on the way. In the case of the standoff, the explosive was put about here and heated up a wedge that was about that wide. And for the fragmenting it, we put it about three meters under the surface, so about ten foot under, uh, down as if you ran the uh, explosive into the surface and it buried itself about ten foot down. Now, one of the important characteristics is what's the strength of this thing? The, most of these guys, as Tom told you, are made of rubble, and so there's nothing holding the pieces of rubble together other than the gravity. But when you press on it, what is the strength like? Well, is it like water? If you step onto water, you just sink right down. It just no strength at all, very little strength. Is it like gravel? When you step onto a sandy or gravelly surface, you actually sink in a ways. Now you're sinking in, and what happens is the force of your weight puts friction between the pieces of gravel, and that creates a strength that stops them from moving out of the way, and it holds you up, so you don't sink in very much. Unless you do something like fill the gravel with water and shake it a little bit, in which case you get liquefaction, and you sink right down. You know, see parts of San Francisco during next earthquake. Uh, rock. We know how to model strength of rock. That's straightforward. So to nudge it, we applied, uh, we applied the energy to uh, this surface region, and in this case it was about 11 and a half kilotons, uh, and it was put into a wedge that was 41 degrees uh, from the pole, so 90 degrees from here to here around. And we looked at the material, the, 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 the pressure wave, that was sent into the thing, and how it went to the far end and reflected back, and you see stuff splashing up. And we looked at, in the end, how much material stayed bound to it. So in this animation over here, all the brown stuff is bound. It's, it, the, the, it received an impulse, and it's traveling at a new speed 
but the gravity of the system itself holds it together and it's bound. Only the white stuff, in fact, comes off. That's, that's the purple over here. And it's about 2% of the mass, in this case, came off. But we pushed it extra hard in this case. We were getting over 2 centimeters a second. So we could have pushed it a little less hard. Now, all that brown stuff is now on a new orbit. It misses the Earth. End of statement. The white stuff that came off, that 2% of the mass, most of it misses the Earth, too. It is possible that pieces of it are still traveling at the original speed. Most of it comes off and is going back at a high speed, but some of it can be traveling at the original speed, in which case it's going to either come near the Earth or hit the Earth still. But it's a tiny, tiny fraction in that case, and you've got a very controlled situation where the bulk of the thing is now just going to miss you. And so nuclear technology to nudge involves standing off. It's the preferred approach because you essentially avoid the entire thing. Detonation at optimal height is required, and in this case we got 98%, but we also got an extra hard push, much more than we needed. So we could do less. What if there's less than a decade? This was the idea when you were 20, 30, 40 years out, and you only needed a centimeter a second. What happens if you get less than 10 years? An example of how that might occur is there's an asteroid called Apophis that we're 99.998% sure is not a problem. However, in the year 2029, it's going to pass between you and the satellite that provides you with TV if you've got DISH TV. And there was someone in the earlier audience that worried considerably about whether he'd be able to watch through it. Uh, this is a 270 meter object, and in the uncertainty of where it's going to pass by the Earth, I mean, we know it's not going to hit the Earth, but in that uncertainty of the area where it's going to pass by the Earth, there is a spot that we know if it goes through that little spot, it will come back seven years later and hit us. And as a 270 meter object, well, I mean, among the possible impact points, it could, we could have a new sea level canal in Costa Rica. Something the Costa Ricans are not in favor of, as it turns out. Uh, so, how would we deal with this? If it goes through that keyhole, the amount of impulse that we have to give it to cause it to miss the Earth is so large that we would break it apart. And so we can't keep it together. We can't just give it a nudge and keep it together. In this case, I'm going to argue that there is actually an advantage in fragmenting it. Okay? Uh, energy is energy. If the effort to fragment an asteroid did not occur until you were in low Earth orbit, as it was shown, an asteroid that's going to hit the Earth and deliver 1,000 megatons or 10,000 megatons of energy, from low, if you only blow it up in low Earth orbit, it's still all the pieces are going to hit, and it's still going to deliver 1,000 uh, megatons or 10,000 megatons of energy. It's just going to spread it out on the surface of the Earth. And if you take that much energy, and let's assume we spread it out over the whole hemisphere of the Earth, it's a thermal pulse that would still burn down everything on that side of the Earth. So the idea is not to wait till low Earth orbit, where you get the pretty shuttle shot. The idea is to do it much earlier than that. So that you, because you, when you blow it up, you will create a debris field. And that debris field, the Earth will pass through it. The point is, you want almost all of it to miss you. And so in this simulation, we uh, placed a, just less than a megaton, uh, as I said, about 10 foot below the surface, and the shock goes through and just blows the thing apart. I mean, we, we, we would say it with fancier words so they pay us at the lab, but um, uh, it blows the thing apart. Uh, it is, its gravity is completely irrelevant by the end of the uh, calculation. Uh, everything's coming apart really fast. And green and blue, uh, blue and green will miss you clean. Uh, when you saw the entire thing at the end of the calculation, all those parts in green and all the parts in blue, they're going so fast forward or backwards, they don't come anywhere near the Earth. But they do form a debris field. Okay? The red stuff here is stuff that's keeping almost the original speed. Not quite, but almost the original speed. That material will still pass near the Earth. So when I track it down those orbits, what I find on average is that 99.999% of it misses the Earth. You still have something hitting the Earth. And in fact, the, the movie that uh, uh, was uh, done that showed uh, 
you break them breaking up the asteroid in low Earth orbit and all the pieces coming down like a beautiful meteor shower. That, in fact, might be close to what would happen uh, because uh, you know, the pieces would miss. This is a separate simulation where the center started out as a solid body, really solid, with the strength of granite. And uh, the blue and green stuff still miss you. The red stuff had about the same velocity. As it turned out, the speed of this large piece in the middle that started out as solid and was in fact broken up rock but still bound to itself, uh, it would have missed the Earth also. But that one was close. And that may say, if in this case, uh, if it's less than 10 years, you don't just send one. You send one out to hit it, and then another one to hit it where it's going to be six months later. So, with less time, fragmentation may reduce a catastrophe to uh, an inconvenience. Uh, the ex a one megaton reduces the impact by factors of 10,000 to 100,000, depending on the orbit. And if you don't like the 10,000, don't use a megaton, use 10 because that's still in the ballpark of what can be carried. When breaking it apart, it's valuable to know the structure. So the first thing you do when you discover an asteroid, especially if it's 20 or 30 years out, is maybe get a mission to go there, because now it's important to know what it's like. You may not have that option if it's merely seven, eight years out. With less time, the fragmentation uh, does create a debris field, and you go through that debris field, uh, and it would take three and a half days for the Earth to get through the debris field. This was on one of my orbits. Uh, and during that time, you would have spectacular meteor showers. Uh, but if you add up all the mass that still comes to the Earth from a one kilometer body, and you were to put it all in one big lump, it's of a size that they don't think would, ever, would usually penetrate the atmosphere. So you know, we would hopefully get off mostly scot-free. The bomb debris, at three years out, I, I set this off with a thousand days to go, so not low Earth orbit. The bomb debris that would be spread out through the solar system, the Earth would be would in fact sweep through that. And if you add up all of the debris that you would sweep up, it uh, would add to the uh, radio radiation background uh, by less than a billionth of what's naturally there. I mean, it would not be measurable the the, the difference. It would be spread, you know, especially if you compare it to the days when. Uh, uh, there was testing by the U.S. and USSR, and you know the USSR tested 50 megatons right on the Earth's surface. So all of that was on the Earth. So the Earth will be hit any million years now by a really big one. By a really big one, yes. But you know, don't panic, as it says here. Um, okay, whatever high school you're at, pick the opposing high school that you hate. And people from that high school in a million years can grow a forebrain. Okay? It's a long time. Nuclear explosives also provide you a potent technology for deflecting them. That's a technology we have in hand. I mean, I don't know what the technology will be 50 years from now, but right now it's a technology we have in hand. They're well tested and well characterized. We don't need to test them. They're in the stockpile and we know what they're going to do. And as to how they will affect uh, asteroids. We're continuing to study that, looking at additional properties as we learn more about asteroids. So I think that's it. Thank you.